Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation about the cognitive factors that lead to suicidality. It's a systematic review. My name is Katerina Nimkova and I'm a clinical psychologist. This research was conducted by myself, uh, David Burley and Alice Shires. So I wanted to do a systematic review on suicidality because to me it seemed like quite a broad uh, topic with a lot of different factors that were taught in graduate school but there didn't seem to be a lot of consistency in our ability to measure how someone progresses from suicidal ideation to suicidal intent. Um, and so what I did is I looked at what was available in the current literature. As we know, suicide is a very uh, common and big impactful problem in our society across all societies. And it's one of the leading causes of death in, uh, in the world. Um, what is regularly cited in research, what I found was that there's a lot of distal uh, factors such as um, being male and um, having access to lethal means, um, but there hasn't been a lot hasn't been a lot of uh, research on the cognitive factors that may be playing a role in this. Um, and so what I had a look at was uh, a few different meta analyses that have already been conducted, uh, the main ones being by May and Kronsky in 2013. Um, and they did have a theory about how uh, someone could progress from suicidal ideation to suicidal intent um, that did have a variety of factors. However, they also included a lot of other factors besides cognitive patterns. So there haven't been any systematic reviews to my knowledge about the cognitive factors specifically that may be attributing to that progression. Um, there is a theory of suicide um, created by Joyner and his colleagues in 2005, um, which uh, posits that someone gains capacity towards suicidal behavior toward, by habituation to pain and fear of death. Um, so, you, so you acquire capacity to suicide or engage in suicide, suicidal behavior, suicidal intent uh, by a number of different factors. Um, these factors uh, distinguish people from suicidal um, uh, ideators to suicidal attempters. And that's basically the main ways that we've researched these categories because of course you can't do a randomly controlled trial. Um, and so it's very difficult to uh, figure out what are the distinguishing groups to measure if someone um, uh, appears in hospital and uh, for a suicidal attempt, that may be one category, someone, um, uh, saying that, disclosing that they are experiencing suicidal ideation in therapy, for example, that might be another category. But um, what I found was that there, in the literature, there's actually not a lot of distinguishing factors. And what most researchers do is they use a really broad uh, perspective, such as suicidal behavior, suicidality, which could mean a number of different things. Um, for example, someone could have uh, a fleeting kind of, I've had a really hard day, um, I'm not feeling so well, you know, this is an option kind of thinking to someone who's actually put together a very concrete plan and gathered the means to complete suicide. And um, those are two very different things, but unfortunately in a lot of research, uh, those two haven't been distinguished um, and they're uh, very likely a lot more than those two categories that I also think would be very important to distinguish between. So not just suicidal ideation, but suicidal intent planning phases and um, I guess 
uh, when, when someone is, is intending to do it in the near future um, is, would, would be kind of the general uh, progression. So I think uh, what, where research has been up to now is focusing on broad factors such as is someone male and are they married and are they suicidal to now moving to what does this specifically mean um, in our clinical practice and uh, how does that change over time. So um, what I did is I had ethical approval, of course, by Prospero. Um, I selected uh, articles by using Scopus, PubMed and PsycInfo to do a literature search. I used quite a broad um, broad terms such as uh, rigidity, um, ideation, fearlessness, intent, behavior. So it was a pretty large number of articles that um, resulted. Um, but the reason why I wanted to do that is because I figured that there would be um, probably, because there's not a lot of consistency in the literature of how we speak about suicide, I thought it would be better to uh, do a broad casting of the net and see what results and um, go by bit by bit than worrying about potentially losing a few um, in the process. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do with my methods was that I wanted to have a way, I wanted the research to have a way of measuring suicidality. So there were a lot of studies that came out that said this person was suicidal, but they had no way of measuring it by using a psychometric or otherwise. And so those were eliminated. Um, I'll talk about the inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria. So the studies that were included were um, in individuals of all races, ethnicities, culture groups. Um, there were no time limits on the published articles. Um, I only had studies included written in English um, that were peer reviewed, which I wish that um, I could have included non-English um, publications, but um, my capacity to translate would have been quite limited. Um, so the studies had to include at least two distinct groups on the suicidal spectrum. So something like suicidal ideation versus suicidal attempt, because again, suicidal behavior is just a really broad term and it doesn't really help us um, distinguish what we're talking about. Um, the papers that used psychometrics um, had to use some sort of standardized and validated method of measuring the cognitive patterns and suicidality. So it had to have both. Um, they had to be experimental by design. Um, uh, sorry, they didn't have to be experimental by, by design because they also included um, cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. So, sorry. <laughs> so I guess that is still experimental, yes. Um, uh, also, I, I specified that the cognitive patterns uh, could not have been historical, so no more than 12 months prior of assessment, and that's just because of um, people's ability to recall. Um, the studies that were excluded were from a non-normative population, so someone with psychosis, for example, studies with a qualitative design, um, those with N less than 10, uh, because of li limited generalizability, case theories, and case reports, any kind of gray literature, including newspapers and so forth. Um, and any uh, papers that did not clearly distinguish between suicidal ideation and intent. Um, and any studies that also did not have uh, clear data available uh, for me to review as well. Um, I can also make all of these other files available. They just did not fit on my poster, unfortunately. Um, and so we extracted the data using Prisma guidelines and recommendations. 
we use the National Institute of Health Quality Assessment Tool um, to assess the quality of the studies to ensure that they were at least good in terms of their results. And we also used a risk of bias tool. So there were that there was a, a lot of variation in terms of sample size from 20 to over a thousand participants. Um, the majority of the studies did have self-reported questionnaires, um, but some did have semi-structured interviews. So that did make a difference in the, the way that I wrote up the discussion aspect of things. So there were a few main um, uh, areas of, of findings. The one, the first one being hopelessness. So hopelessness is a very interesting variable to find in terms of a cognitive pattern that um, may or may not have an influence on suicidality. And um, there was a lot of variation in uh, the research out there, but overall, it suggested that there was some evidence in longitudinal studies that someone who experienced hopelessness could eventually die by suicide um, at some point. But uh, there, there wasn't a lot of um, clear evidence that would suggest that someone with uh, hopelessness would um, be more towards suicidal attempt or intent as opposed to ideation. It seemed like it was pretty um, even across the spectrum. And the other thing was that there was one study that tried to find hopelessness specifically on suicide. So a factor that specifically me measured suicidal hopelessness, I suppose is the best term. Um, but that was one very small study. And so I wish that there was more research on something like that, because again, hopelessness could mean a lot of different things. Uh, the next category was perceived burdensomeness and thwarted belongingness. Um, so that's basically this idea that um, it'd be better off if I was gone. I don't belong in my community. I don't feel supported. Um, and this did have some very interesting implications because it belongs back to that theory of Joyner of um, the factors that do contribute to suicidality. And um, the studies that I found certainly stated that this was an important factor. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the discussion. Um, the next category was what we call acquired capacity, otherwise known as um, fearlessness. So um, again, this fits very nicely into Joyner's theory because he does um, speak about this. And it basically suggests that someone needs to reduce their levels of fear in, over, in order to overcome their self-preservation reflexes um, to die. And so not being afraid of death and not being afraid of pain um, is one of the main things that can um, tip someone from suicidal ideation to suicidal intent. So that fearlessness plays a really big role in suicidal attempt. Um, the next factor is rumination. So there were two cross-sectional studies and one long longitudinal study measuring rumination that was included and basically their results were quite inconclusive. They found um, that there was a limited association between ideation, suicidal attempts and so forth um, in, in uh, clinical trials or in, in um, trials. So again, the aim of this study was to uh, review the current state of the evidence in a systematic way by um, examining the cognitive characteristics um, that correlate with suicidal severity. Um, so what these findings suggest is that there most definitely is a pattern and association with suicidal severity and cognitive factors. Um, it's just that we haven't quite 
um, figured out which ones to measure, unfortunately, and which ones correlate accordingly. Um, but there does seem to be a pretty distinguishable differentiation between people who um, ideate in the way that they think about it to people who intend and plan and attempt. And, um, and it was interesting, um, the results of hopelessness that they were quite scattered, to be honest, um, because hopelessness is taught to be one of the primary factors um, when it comes to assessing risk in um, the clinical setting. And I think that there is a lot of room for improvement to understand what does hopelessness actually mean? And how does that look for people who are suicidal in some way? And how do we move that along the spectrum? There was also quite a lot of differentiation in terms of the way that we measure suicidality. So, um, understanding the differences between passive suicidal thoughts and active suicidal thoughts. Um, one of these scales that was really useful was called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, or the CSSRS, by Posner et al. Uh, 2011. And this is something that would be very useful if we used more systematically across research um, pertaining to suicide. Um, I, I did find that it was very interesting that these uh, results of this review did align quite neatly with um, Joyner's theory of suicidality, um, specifically in terms of perceived burdensomeness, belongingness, and fearlessness. Um, however, I have to say that these are only a few studies that we're talking about. I think that there were about 19 overall in the end that I found that um, did meet the criteria that I specified. Um, so I think that it is really important to keep in mind that yes, it does align. However, there's still so much more research that we'd have to do. The results are quite limited. And that leads me to the conclusion that um, these results highlight the importance of research um, in the ideation to action framework. Um, it's really important that we use some sort of consistency in the definition of suicidal behavior and how it changes over time, how we measure that, and also how we measure cognitive patterns. What do they actually mean? So in, in my inclusion criteria, they all have to have very specific definitions of what does hopelessness mean? What does rumination mean? and almost every study had a different definition for these, um, which made it very difficult to summarize and generalize any of these findings. Obviously, the main factors that um, we discussed in terms of fearlessness, hopelessness, rumination, and so forth, those are very limited factors. And of course, there's many more factors that are very likely having a role in someone's cognitive processing. Um, but unfortunately, um, these haven't been examined in any thorough way, to my knowledge. And so it would be very beneficial if there was a more um, comprehensive assessment, um, uh, some sort of large research um, uh, approach to to measure what what do people say how do they think when they first present uh, perhaps in therapy and disclose suicidal ideation what does that look like to people who may have uh, attempted suicide and how do they speak about um, their experience and their way of thinking um, and I think that if we were to interview um, these people we would find that there's actually a broad uh, amount of cognitive factors that do differentiate um, across the spectrum of the groups.
And the last thing that I'd like to say is that um, because this is such a huge public health crisis and it is so important that we get this right, that um, these do have really significant clinical implications for our practice. For example, someone like me is um, more of a practicing psychologist rather than a researcher by trade. And to me, um, I feel like there are some tools available for us in terms of assessing risk. But um, again, that risk feels quite broad. And especially for newer training clinicians, um, there should be a bit more information available to determine where does this person um, sit at the moment and how do we respond appropriately to be able to help them and minimize the risk of harm. Um, I think that these are incredibly important questions for our practice and for our field, but also um, for the population in general. If we don't understand um, the full spectrum of suicidality and how to respond and how to assess risk, then um, how is the public supposed to be able to trust us to be able to respond accordingly? That's all I have. I'm sorry that this was a little bit long. Um, I will be in the breakout room later today. So if you have any questions, um, I'd love to speak to you about it then. Okay, thanks.